To the family and friends of Forest Hill Church gathered across all of our six campuses, and for those of you that are gathered online, welcome. So delighted that you have chosen today especially to be here to hear from our guest speaker. Our guest speaker has been doing ministry for over 40 years. He's pastored in churches across our country. He's also authored and encouraged many people through his books. Hundreds of thousands of people have been nurtured and inspired by his books, the titles of which include uh, The Me I Want to Be, Who Is This Man, Eternity Is Now in Session, and Soul Keeping. Currently, he is the leader of a new ministry. It's called becomenew.com. It's an online resource focused on helping people grow spiritually one day at a time through daily emails and texts and audio and visual as well as podcasts available to everyone. At the very core of that ministry is the conviction that the main thing that God wants out of us is the person that we become. The mission of John's life indeed has been inspired by his friend and his mentor, the late Dallas Willard, for spiritual transformation. His desires to facilitate the kind of transformation of the character of a human being through authentic experiences with God. John right now lives in the Bay Area in California with his amazing wife of 40 years, Nancy, who is a, a dynamic leader in her own right. And together they have three children as well as grandchildren. He has a very busy ministry of teaching and preaching in a way that continues to encourage Christ followers and churches and leaders and coaches and authors and speakers. But we're glad and very honored to have him here today with us here at Forest Hill Church. So would you please give a warm Forest Hill welcome to, not yet, okay, hang on, it's coming, theologian and teacher, scholar, pastor, but also a friend and a follower of Christ, John Ortberg. Now you can clap. There you go. Thank you. Bless you, my friend. Uh, thank you, Ed. It's very, very kind. It's a great honor to be here with you. Um, I want to start by looking directly at the text. If you're visiting at any particular campus, uh, you may not know that uh, Forest Hill Church has been looking at a letter that Paul wrote to the church in Colossae for wisdom about how to live. And we come now to the third chapter, starting with the 18th verse. And it's the custom here to stand when the scripture is read. So if you're able, I want to invite you to stand and hear... Uh, this ancient wisdom. These are the words of the Apostle Paul. Wives, submit to your husbands, as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives, and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters. Not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. Masters, Treat your bondservants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. The word of God to us, you may be seated. You all have spent the last several weeks studying some of the most inspiring spiritual guidance ever given to the human race, particularly in this magnificent third chapter of Paul's letter, he starts out by saying, set your mind on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father. Set your heart on things above, for you died, your life is hidden with Christ in God. Therefore, he goes on, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with, with compassion, kindness, gentleness, patience, Humility. Over all these virtues, put on love, all the way up to the 17th verse. Therefore, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. 
Those are words of such transcendently beautiful wisdom that they are still being memorized 2,000 years later. And your staff has been unpacking them week by week. And now this passage about patriarchy and slavery and wives do what your husbands want you to do and slaves obey your masters, this is the passage you have saved for me. So I will talk about it for a little while and then fly 3,000 miles away. Uh, probably a good thing. But it's real important that we look at this. A lot of people have the concern or the idea that the Bible is either racist or sexist or patriarchal or not really concerned about justice. And this is a great barrier for folks in terms of having a robust faith in God or confidence that the scriptures really do reveal to us some transcendent wisdom. So I want to take the first part of this message to address these concerns. And then in the last part, we'll look at what does this mean for us, particularly one word that Paul talks about that's at the core of his instruction that can change your life, our lives, and our worlds. But first, I want to walk through these concerns and that will involve wading through some historical material that I know I know is kind of laborious, but I think it will be worth it, so I will ask for your patience, okay? I think it will be worth it, so I will ask for your patience, okay? You guys are scaring me a little bit. Um, first of all, this question, is the Bible pro-slavery? One of the ironies, as you all know, of the Civil War in America was that both pro-slavery folks and anti-slavery folks claimed the Bible as justification for their position. And pro-slavery preachers in churches would read texts like the one that we just read, Colossians 3.22. Slaves, bondservants, obey your earthly masters and everything. And there's similar commands in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 5. The first letter of Peter, chapter 2, verse 18. And so pro-slavery preachers would say, it's right there in the Bible. Slaves, obey your masters. The Bible is clearly pro-slavery. However, as you probably know, the great moral forces of abolition against slavery were overwhelmingly Christian. Wilbur, uh, William Wilberforce in the United Kingdom and John Wesley and then Frederick Douglass, who was a very devoted follower of Jesus Christ, Jonathan Blanchard. They would cite the golden rule, do to others what you would have them do to you, or the command, love your neighbor as yourself, or the prophet's demand for justice, going to roll like a river. Abraham Lincoln, in his remarkable second inaugural address that struggled with the meaning of the Civil War, noted both sides, north and south, read the same Bible, pray to the same God, each invokes his aid against the other. And all of this, very often in our day, leads people to think that really anybody can twist any part of the Bible into saying whatever they want it to, and therefore any claim to be actually guided by the Scripture is kind of spurious, is kind of suspect. And I think that that is deeply untrue. So I want to look for a moment at quite a helpful framework for viewing the Bible and social systems, society and so on, among others, a New Testament scholar named William Webb writes about this. It's really important to understand about the Bible. We believe that it's the Word of God as Christians, and also that it was written by real people. And sometimes folks in church don't understand this about it. The Bible is not an abstract, ahistorical, heavenly blueprint for a utopia any place on earth. It was written by real people who lived in a real culture, in a real point in time, and commanded kind of doable changes, so they would be limited but doable, that pointed in the direction of God's ultimate justice and love and concern. Now, in the ancient world where the Bible was written, dynamics like patriarchy, slavery, polygamy, monarchy were pretty much universal. All cultures the Bible engaged with included slavery. Canaanite, Egyptian, Ethiopian, Syrian, Babylonian, Greece. In ancient Rome, it's thought that between one-third and one-half of all the inhabitants were slaves. And it's like, not like there was an alternative. There was no economic system without slavery in that ancient world. 
But it turns out, it turns out the biblical commands in the Old Testament consistently undermine the power of slave owners when you contrasted that with the ancient Near East in which the Bible was written. So, for example, just run through a few of these. In the ancient Near Eastern world, there was no provision for slaves to be released. But in the Bible, in the book of Leviticus, the Israelites were told to release their slaves after seven years of service. It was to be temporary. In the ancient Near East, outside of Israel, there, was, there were no provisions to be given to a slave that was freed. But in Deuteronomy 15, the Israelites were told to give generously to freed slaves. In the ancient Near East, as well as in Greece and in Rome, slave owners could, publish, could punish any slave at any time for any reason, but Exodus put very significant restrictions on how a slave could and could not be punished. In the ancient world, generally, slaves were given little or no time off for holidays. But in Deuteronomy 16 and in Deuteronomy 31, slaves in Israel were given remarkably generous amounts of holidays, feast days. They were to be given every Sabbath off for rest, which was unprecedented in the ancient world. In the rest of the ancient world, runaway slaves carried a bounty. And nations would make treaties with each other to make sure that runaway slaves would be returned. You might have heard of an ancient law, the Code of Hammurabi in Babylon, imposed the death sentence on anyone that helped a runaway slave. By contrast, Deuteronomy 23 said Israel was to provide sanctuary to runaway slaves. This is a radical departure. And then, in addition to all of these ways of kind of undermining the power of slave owners, there were remarkable, what might be called seedbed texts in the Old Testament that ran contrary to the spirit of slavery and carried the seeds of dignity and human worth and liberation. Only Israel's Bible taught every single human being was made in the image of God. In the ancient Near Eastern world, often tribal religions would say, that maybe the chieftain or the king was made in the image of whoever the greatest god in their pantheon was. Only Israel said every human being made in his image, and that every human being was called to exercise dominion. That was in Genesis 1. Or teach that the prophet's requirement was that all were to do justice and love mercy and walk humbly before our God. And then by the time we get to the New Testament, we have this teaching that every human being was the object of Christ's sacrificial love. That Jesus, the great Messiah, humbled himself and made himself a servant, a slave, and suffered crucifixion, which was called the slave's death in ancient Rome, because only slaves were, uh, had that punishment inflicted on them, and that's what Jesus took on himself. And Paul wrote, Galatians 3.28, There is neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. So when people in the ancient world looked at commands in the Bible about slavery, those writings looked to them remarkably progressive when they were written. We look at those passages about slavery, and to us they look quite regressive, but that is largely because we live in a society where the teachings of the Bible that undermined slavery and promoted human equality and dignity and rights uh, eventually led largely through the work of Christ-following thinkers and reformers to a society, to an expression that is much more compatible with God's will for human flourishing than the evils of slavery. And the Bible was prominently responsible for that shift. On one other obvious note, maybe the greatest evil of American slavery, unlike slavery in Bible times, is that it was race-based slavery. This was not true in the ancient world. The enslavement of Africans. You may know about this. Sociologists and historians have written about this. The concept of race as we know it was largely invented in the colonial era. 
That's why you don't see language about race. In the scriptures, we see a lot about uh, the nations and cultures and languages and tribes, not races. The concept of the white race or the black race was essentially an invention in colonial times to justify the enslavement of dark-skinned peoples. And we still live with the hell which that unleashed. I'll tell you one other indicator of how anti-slavery the Bible is when it's taken as a whole. The Museum of the Bible in Washington, D.C. recently had on exhibit something that was called the Slave Bible. I think you'll see a picture of this coming up now on the screens. This is a real thing, not making this up. The Slave Bible was published in 1808 in order to convert Africans to Christianity to make them good slaves. However, the publishers of the Slave Bible were concerned that some parts of the Bible might encourage slaves to want to be free, so they took those parts of the Bible out. So they took out the entire book of Exodus. Remember what the book of Exodus is about? That's about the people of Israel who had been slaves in Egypt getting freed because God led them out of slavery. They thought, better take that out of the Bible. So that's not in the slave's Bible. And again, there's still copies of this Bible around. They took out the book of Revelation that talks about how God's justice is going to triumph at the end of time. They thought, that's triumphant justice, better take that out. They took out every mention of liberty or freedom in the Bible. Paul wrote to Corinth, for example, and one of his arguments for radical unity was, we've all been baptized in one spirit to form one body, whether Jews or Gentile, slave or free. They took that verse out of the Bible. In fact, again, not making this up, there are 1,189 chapters in the standard Protestant Bible. There were 232 chapters in the slave Bible. To make the Bible safe for slaves, they had to take out about 80% of the chapters. Because they knew slavery and particularly race-based slavery, is a system deeply at odds with the worth and dignity of every human being as somebody made by God and loved by God. And no book ended up being more dangerous to slavery when taken as a whole than the Bible. That's the Bible and slavery. Now, how about wives and husbands? Does the Bible teach that men are superior to women and are supposed to be in charge? And the short answer, I believe, taken as a whole, is no, it does not. From the beginning, we're told God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. He created them. Israel was unique in the ancient world in teaching that every human being, including both male and and female equally bear God's image. And both were given dominion. Both were to partner with God to rule over, serve, bring good out of all of creation. Sometimes people will argue from uh, the order of creation that since God made the man first and then the woman, it means that the man is more important, where the man is to have power over the woman. problem with the argument for order is it cuts both ways. You could say God started with the animals, and then God made man, and then God said, I'm through warming up now, and he made women, and that's the best work that he did. The reality is they are both image bearers. Sometimes people think in Genesis 2.18, as you may know, it talks about the woman being created to be a helper for man. And folks sometimes think that means that the woman was made to be his assistant, kind of like a gopher or something. But in the Bible, that word helper is most often used to describe God. God is our help and our shield. So clearly it does not mean somebody lower on the organizational chart. God created human beings in his image, male and female, because they would have the capacity to experience oneness, just as God does, Father, Son, And Holy Spirit, Trinity, three and yet one, makes human beings two, but the two shall become one. That's such a wonderful gift. We hardly ever get tired of asking people 
if they're married, how did you get to know each other? How did you meet each other? In the Bible, when the woman is brought to man, he breaks out in poetry. This is flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone. She should be called woman. I first met my wife, Nancy, through a church. We met on a blind date, and the couple that introduced us uh, that next day went back. They lived 2,000 miles away. I didn't know how to get in touch with Nancy. The only way I knew how to contact her was I knew she went to a church. What are your area Baptist fellowship? And I was working at a church in La Crescenta. So I called up that church and I said, I need the phone number of one of your attenders, Nancy Berg. My name's John Orberg. I'm a pastor at First Baptist Church at La Crescenta. It's kind of a ministry thing. I need the phone number of this woman. And, and the receptionist put me on hold and was gone for like five minutes and then finally came back and gave me Nancy's number. What I did not know then and didn't learn for another six months is the receptionist of that church was Nancy's mother, <laughs> Vernaberg. And she put me on hold and called Nancy and said, there's some guy, John Orberg says he wants your phone number. Should I give it to him? Really? For whatever reason, thank God, Nancy said yes. And, and here we are today. And we love hearing those kind of stories. How did you meet? That, that the gift of sexuality, male and female, is God's gift. And it's a great thing. Whether we're married or singles, we are created as sexual beings. Whether we're married or single, we're equally a part of God's family, equal worth and so. Uh, that's all gift. But then comes sin and the fall, and then comes conflict and blaming and wrestling over power. You might know if you know the story. God says to Adam, have you eaten from the tree that I forbade you to eat from? And the man, anybody remember what the man's response was? It was the woman. It was the woman you put here with me. Let's see, whose idea was this one? Wasn't mine. She gave me the fruit and I ate it. Now, there's the beginning then of blaming and fault-finding that goes on. There's the loss of oneness. And, and God pronounces the impact of the fall, sometimes called the curse. Ground will be thorns and thistles. And death will be a part of the story. And part of the curse is, he says to the woman, now as a result of the fall, your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. Now, what's striking is sometimes this will be taught as though that was God's intent for marriage. He will rule over you. That's not God's original intent for marriage. That's the curse. That's like death and pain and childbearing and thorns and thistles. That's part of what Jesus came to overturn. And I won't take the time to go through it. But in the Old Testament, if you ever study it quite closely, you see exactly the same pattern of undermining the power of patriarchy uh, that we saw in undermining the power of the slaveocracy. When we get to the New Testament, the way that Jesus relates to women is quite subversive. For example, we're told in the Gospel of Luke that Mary, the story about Mary and Martha, Mary sat at the feet of Jesus. And sometimes we think of that just as kind of a hallmark moment, you know, Mary's being contemplative or quiet or something. Actually, that phrase, to sit at the feet of someone, was a technical term in the first century that meant to be someone's disciple. Paul says in uh, the book of Acts, I sat at the feet of Gamaliel. I was in grad school. I was a disciple of Gamaliel. Jesus is the first rabbi in known history to have women as well as men as disciples. He shocked his own followers by having his longest spiritual theological conversation in the Gospels with a Samaritan woman at the well. At the cross, it was the women who dared to stay with him when the men ran away. It was women who were the first witnesses of the resurrection. This in a day when women were not even allowed often to serve as witnesses in a court. One of the reasons scholars say we can have great confidence that the resurrection happened in history is that if it was made up, nobody would have made up a story where women were the witnesses of it. And so 
Uh, in the house churches in the New Testament, women have active roles as leaders. They learn. They publicly prophesy. Paul talks about this. They publicly pray before women and men. Paul says, there is now, therefore, neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, neither is there male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. There had never been a community like this before. Never been the idea of it. A historical uh, uh, historian, Thomas Cahill, says this was the first expression of egalitarian thought in human history. Now, here's the deal. It was not accidental that these verses, Colossians 3, 18 through 4, verse 1, come after the great spiritual formation wisdom of Colossians 3, 1 through 17. Do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him. What's going on here is Paul now is simply working out what will this life, this transformed way of life, where I'm now receiving power from God and pouring out my life and love for other people, clothing myself in compassion, setting my mind on doing everything in the name of Jesus. What will that look like in the real world, in their real society, in the roles that were part of that world? Now, um, the, the one primary word that I want to talk about, we see there's a parallel passage to this one in Colossians, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21. Paul starts it by saying this, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your own husband. Notice he doesn't restrict submitting to wives or women or slaves or people low down. This is to be a community where everyone submits to everyone. Not out of fear of their power, but out of reverence to Jesus. This was the striking word that made a community of another kind submit to one another. We are to live with submitted wills. Now, what does that mean? Let's talk about that for a minute. You have a will. That's your little kingdom. You know, we don't use the word kingdom very much, but it's Bible language. And the idea is your kingdom is where your will reigns, where things are the way you want them to be, where you have influence, where you are in charge, starting with your little body and then spreading out from there. That's what makes you human. That's why watching a little baby grow and develop is so amazing. When we had our first child, I had an experience I did not anticipate. After giving birth, Nancy handed that little girl, Laura, to me in the first moments of her life. And it was as if all of a sudden I could see the trajectory of her whole life flash before my eyes. I said, Nancy, it's so amazing to think this little blob of tissue that I'm holding right here, this little baby is going to grow. And this little red hair, she was born with one little strip of red hair like a mohawk on her head. This red hair is going to turn gray one day, and then it will turn white one day. And this skin that is so smooth and pink right now is going to get mottled, and then it's going to get wrinkled, and then we're going to grow old, and we will die. And then she will grow old. She'll become an old lady, and then she will die, this tiny little baby that I'm holding. And Nancy said, let me hold her. You're creeping her out. <laughs> this, this, you know, when we see a little child born, we know there is something of immense mystery and worth there. They have a kingdom or a queendom. That's part of what makes you human. That's a very good thing. And they learn about it. Their body, that's what, why development is such a miracle, to watch a little child be able to walk and speak. Matter, for crying out loud, atoms and molecules are coming under the direction of a personal will and mind. And they rejoice in this. What's a two-year-old's favorite word? No. What's their second favorite word? Mine. They're learning they have a kingdom. See, those are kingdom words. Yes, no, mine. That's kingdom language. That's a very good thing. Problem is, sin gets into our kingdoms. 
And we want our will, we want our ego to be on the throne. My kingdom come, my will be done. And then my kingdom and your kingdom come in conflict with each other. And then we have the mess of our world, and it expresses ourselves in sexuality and in racial injustice and all kinds of ways. But at the core of it is just in every one of us. I want my will to be done. And Jesus comes and shows us another way. He, how does he teach us to pray? Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And at the end of his life, at the great crisis facing the cross, he goes and prays to his Father if it's possible, could this cup be taken from me? Nevertheless, not my will. Your will be done. So see, the point of the text is really pretty simple. How can you make your real life, now you think about this, your relationships, your family, your work, your money, your time, your energy, your goals, an act of servanthood? where you live with a submitted will. In other words, just the fact that I happen to want something is no longer ultimate. Because I'm receiving care and love and guidance and power from God. So I don't have to worry about my little agenda anymore. I'm willing to let go of merely trying to have my own way in order to care for and build up and contribute to the lives of others. And then the gathering of the church, Forest Hill Church, like the Church of Colossae, that was a new kind of community. It had not existed before. Submit yourselves one to the other. This is the law of the kingdom. Community is built on servanthood. But I don't know about you. I can talk about serving much better than I actually do at it. Anybody else here in that camp? Only me? Early on in our marriage, I would talk about this stuff, but we had three little kids under the age of four at one time. And the vast majority of our arguments were over division of labor and whose life was easier. And I would talk about husbands serve, you know, give, all that kind of stuff. But if there was a camera on me at home, and I remember Nancy explaining to me, John, do you understand? Because community is built on servanthood. Do you understand that when I see you serving, it does something in my heart towards you. When I see you vacuuming the rug without being asked, I feel romantic towards you. When I see you emptying the dishwasher, it kindles something in my heart for you. When I see you giving our kids a bath, I feel physical desire for you. I used to bathe those kids three and four times a day. <laughs> come home at 9 o'clock at night, kids sleeping. Get out of bed, kids. Get in the tub. Nance, come here. Look, there they are. Just built on servanthood. That's what community is built on. Not my will. Your will be done. To love one another. Husbands, are you doing this for your wife? So interesting. In Ephesians, when Paul has, again, this similar passage he says, wives, submit to your husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Think about a couple of the church that I most recently served, Hank and Jan. And uh, Hank was a very successful business guy. Uh, Jan, in uh, many, many decades ago now, ended up contracting a disease that slowly took away her ability to walk and to move. And so Hank was able to do this. He retired very early from his job so that he could just take care of Jan. And his prayer was, God, would you allow her to go before me so I could care for her throughout our life? They got a place in Hawaii. They were very generous and they asked me, would it be okay if they made it available to our staff to come for a free vacation? I said, well, Nancy and I will have to go check it out to make sure. But uh, very generous in that way. They would come to the same service every time. She would be in her wheelchair. He would be sitting right next to her. And a few years ago, she died at the age of 90, and Hank died three days later.
And I think in God's eyes, maybe his greatest achievement, maybe his greatest accomplishment was just day after day after day to feed and dress and wash and care for and wheel the body of the one that he'd promised himself to so long ago. Doesn't get anybody on magazine covers in this world. That's the kingdom. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Fathers, don't exasperate your children. How easy it is for me when I get irritated to want to use my power, my force with my children just to have things the way that I want them to be. Children, learn that as you're able to serve, as you're able to give, as little children discover that just getting my way, no, mine, are good words to learn, but they're bad words to live by when you grow up. For little children to learn that is such an important thing. To love means to will and to work for the good of the others. I surrender what I happen to desire. If surrendering that will produce what is truly good in the other person. And I can do that because I know that God is watching out for me. I'm living in his kingdom. In the sphere of God's effective will. What does that mean for your work? Paul says, work with your whole heart. Not just because people are looking at you. Not just because you'll get credit for it. Because in some way that we don't fully understand, but is literally true, you are working for Jesus. Jesus is blessed. When you give, when you try to help, when you add value into the lives of other people, whatever your job happens to be, or in the care of creation, it blesses God. Uh, uh, what does it look like to work with your own uh, whole heart? One quick story about this one from the Bible. Um, Abraham wants a wife for his son, Isaac. He sends his servant, and the servant prays a prayer, God, send a woman that will fetch water. And she does what he prays for. Her name is Rebecca, and she says to him, uh, if you will come, the well was a big deal in that day. Come to the well. I will get water for you to drink. And she says, I will get water for your camels also. Now, we would tend to just read that real quickly. His servant, we're told in this story, had 10 camels. Do you know how much water one camel can drink? 30 gallons of water, 10 camels. That means she was saying, I will draw up to 300 gallons of water. It's a woman with some serious biceps. And because she did this, she would become a part of God's story, God's kingdom. She would end up marrying Isaac. She would be the mother of a patriarch. She would be remembered throughout the history of Israel. She would be known and celebrated all around the world thousands of years later. Here's the key. She didn't know that's what she was uh, going to get rewarded by. She just did it. She did all that could be reasonably expected of her, and then some, and then some. So when you think about your work, what paid, unpaid, you know, volunteer, part-time, full-time, job you love, job you hate, what would it look like for you to go do what could be reasonably expected of you, and then some? These passages are just fleshing this stuff out. Jesus, you know, in his day, as you may know, in Israel, they were in occupied territory. There were Roman soldiers that were in charge of stuff. Mostly quite young boys from neighboring countries in Israel. Not liked at all. Life was very hard for them. They were pretty much despised. They could, by law, command an Israelite to carry their backpack or burden for one mile. And as you might imagine... The general tendency was when people had to do that, let them know how much you despise them and how much you don't want to do this. And Jesus said, yeah, here's an idea. Since you're living in God's kingdom, um, the next time that happens, you've got to carry that burden and you get to the end of that mile, just ask them, could I take it another mile for you? Your life's probably pretty hard. And you also are one of those human beings that God made and God loves. Could I... Could I could I carry your burden for you another mile? Here's an idea if you want to live in the kingdom. Do everything that could be reasonably expected of you, what the law requires, and then so. So when you go into your work, whatever your work happens to be, just carry that phrase with you, and then some. If you do this, if you submit yourselves to one another, if you surrender your little kingdom to God, not my will but yours be done, 
Offer servanthood. Work with your whole heart. Become an and then some kind of person. God will lift you up. You will become part of Jesus' cosmic project for good in the universe. Your work will have purpose. However important or unimportant it may look to this world, the people around you will be blessed by you. And very often, they will want to bless you back. You will never have to wonder, what is my mission or what is my passion? But simply look around at what needs to be done that nobody else is doing, like washing feet maybe, and then do it with a willing spirit. And your life in this world will be a God-powered adventure in doing good. And in the world to come, you will hear, well done, good and and faithful servant. And if you know of a better offer than that, let me know because I would like to be a part of it. So I want to ask now, if you would, pray together with me. Heavenly Father, thank you that you have created us and that you love us so dearly. And that that's true of every other person that we see. Thank you that our lives can be part of your great kingdom. And if you're, as you're listening to these words, you have never surrendered your life to Jesus, never offered him wholehearted obedience, made him your savior and forgiver and leader, you can do that right now, right now. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would help each person here, people who have been the victims of great injustice or unfairness, marginalized, neglected, overlooked. People that maybe have quite a lot of influence and need the gift of your humility and a willing spirit. Would you pour out great blessing on this place? We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.